All right, can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's a pleasure to see you here. Pleasure to be, it feels like home. This is not uh, officially my home, unofficially my home. I've been uh, in this land sharing this beauty, looking at that lake for a long time. Uh, I claim friends and families, uh, Frank and Lori, uh, in my own family, and many more I get to know. Oh, good morning, Dawn. There you are. Good to see you. So I'm going to talk about <clears throat> indigenous families, but more than that, how, how I report that to the federal government. They're my biggest critic. That's okay. It, they need to be educated anyway, so it's all right. So this is, this is a federal research program, and they have their idea of how data should be submitted, and I have an idea how it's to be submitted. I'm pretty hard-headed, so... It works in my favor. But anyway, if you have questions, just let me know. We'll be happy to entertain those, those questions. <clears throat> the work is sponsored by uh, the number one, other than this place, American Indian Research in the Nation. I'm biased, but it's my own. I, I created the foundation I work with because of federal bureaucracy. You get a federal grant. There is not a line item for a gift for an elder in there. There's not a line item for food. I'm going, what the heck are we doing then? You know, fight about that. So I created a foundation and I can do what I want with that. Well, I can't rob banks, you know, I got to follow the IRS rules, which are broad, but I don't have to worry about breaking rules with an institution. Nor do I have to shine up to an institution that wants to have a uh, castle type of uh, mentality where it rolls up its drawbridges if they don't like working with you and you got to yell at them to roll it down. I can cross boundaries, cross institutions, and uh, reach who I want to reach, which is the students. How many students are in the room? If you'll please stand up, if you're a student, of any K through gray student. Let's give them a round of applause, please. Yeah. Thank you. This is our future. This is, this is why a lot of us are in this business, and I know that's why uh, Lori and, and Frank and the other Frank do the good work they do because of students. So we'll get started. Here we go. Oh, where's Finley at? I got something to tell him. He comes back. Castor Candonesis. This is in harmony. As you can see, the beads of water on that animal because it's, it's perfect how it should be. Doesn't need improved. It's beaded up, chewing one of its favorite uh, branches, and its heart is content. I know that. I hang around these, these animals more than I do people, and I get in trouble because where they live, rarely are there cell phones. And if they were, I'd be surprised. So I'm with these guys a lot. I can tell a content animal versus non-content. That's uh, one of the focuses of our story today. Two-eyed seeing. This whole concept comes from Lori's tribe, one of the, her elders, Elder Albert. And I, the minute I seen this, it just resonated with me. I'll let you read through that, that slide. But essentially, it's one eye seeing with indigenous knowledge and feeling, and the other eye, Western solid science and knowledge. Most importantly, what El Elder Albert sh shared is that two eyes come together for the benefit of all. Not just natives, not just non-natives. Mainly, when I talk to him later about this, the benefit of the children or students. That's what he was talking about. And two-eyed seeing <clears throat> is a gift. And it's multiple perspectives. We don't get that a lot. If you're an indigenous person in a Western science realm, it's kind of tough telling your story because your mentors, your professors, your funding agency don't even know what you're talking about. They're trained with one paradigm, which is so ironic. If you come to a university where you should have an open mind, some of the closed, most closed mind ideas I've ever seen because on this one, because they're not trained that way. If they haven't been trained that way, it can't be true. Well, it is. 
So this is a two-eyed seeing approach, but it's how I report it to the federal government. So they open in both of their eyes and ears and hopefully their hearts now. So before I get started, I forgot my manners. One thing, I have two watches on. Both are gifts. This one kind of keeps me on time, which I'll go over anyway. I know I will, but I try to look at it. And I just thought, wouldn't it be cool to put these two watches on? Just want to share that with you. There's nothing, <laughs> nothing else going on there. But anyway, um, so Finley, I'm going to get started because I don't know where he's at. When he heard, he says, not this again, because I've been with his, these beavers a lot. The other thing I, I do a lot is a NASA program called Fun with Urine. Don't get me started there. <laughs> I have lots of going on there too, but this is an update, an update of, of beavers and, and uh, two-eyed seeing, but actually how, how you report it, how does that go to the federal government? So <clears throat> start off, we have complaints, not human compliments or good times with beavers, but complaints. So I'll get, I work with students and I'll get a, uh, a call from our fishing game, said we have a beaver problem. What's your solution? Kill the animal. Really? Yeah. All right. I said, maybe there's another way. What do you mean? Well, we can work with students, think about a different way of looking at things. Two-eyed seeing. So easy to kill something. A lot harder to create something out. And so the students and I look at that, and we try to figure out ways of not killing the animal, but with two-eyed seeing concepts, how to live in harmony. These are some of the complaints I get. And again, the solution is to kill the animal. Well, I'll tell you one thing, they're not that hard, they're not that easy to kill. And another thing I've grown to appreciate is that there's a parallel universe, I'll use that word, universe, with humans and beavers. Beavers are round and brown, a lot like myself, except they're cuter than I am. They uh, were hunted, they don't speak English, they live in lodges, live with families, and they were hunted to a brink of extinction. But I've been told by the elders, and this talk, by the way, is dedicated to the youth and elders of the Shoshone Bannock Nation. I owe them so much. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my brothers and sisters on that tribe that helped me get to where I'm going to go. The elders wanted me to work with beavers. They come, because I'm a, I'm a, a chemistry teacher, among other things, so I consider myself a recovering chemist. I'm not a mammologist. And they said, Ed, you need to work with beavers. Okay, what for? This was about 15 years ago. Because they're going to help us with water. Yeah, but I don't know about beavers. I go, ah, 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 we don't want to hear about that. That's your job. Okay. <clears throat> so I started to learn about beavers. But other people, when they see them, they don't view them as compliment, they view them as a nuisance. My good friend Dan Wildcat said, what if we looked at nature as our family? Everything related to everything else. And even though in some families you have a crazy uncle or weird auntie, you don't sell them, at least I hope you don't. You don't kill them, which I hope you don't, but you find harmony with them, which is I hope you do. Here we can see that this beaver family had decided to take a challenge at these trees, which is right at the edge of a park in the town of Pocatello, and that river is called the Portniff River. So they're, they're munching on these trees. Here the complaint was <clears throat> they're chewing down these trees, and that's the edge of the park. And I said, yeah, but I think there's a bigger complaint. Why is there a homeless family living on the banks of the river, and that's their shopping cart. And nobody even said anything about that. It's these beavers. Got to kill them. Ay, ay, ay. So anyway, <clears throat> that was kind of ironic. This is a great story. <laughs> so I get a call. Uh, this is so hilarious. At least hilarious to me. I get a call from the Forest Service. They go, Ed, we got a problem with beavers. I won't tell you what their solution was, you should figure that out by now. I go, all right, let me, let me take a look. I see this. I got a ranger right on my right-hand side saying, see this? I go, yeah, that's what beavers do. 
And they go, well, that's not acceptable in the forest. It was a public camping ground. I go, why not? And he goes, honest truth, because the campers will walk, they'll stumble, and they'll impale themselves on this (laughs) stick. And I told the ranger, that's a good thing. And he says, how can that be a good thing? And I said, because if our species is that damn dumb, they should be impaled on a stick, you know, if they can't watch where they're going. (sighs) So they didn't take that answer too well, you know, too I'd see in here. So we had volunteers, and we cut these to the ground, and they still wanted to kill them after that. But, yeah, that was the reason here, because they're impaled as they walk through the forest. Uh, So, anyway, we end up moving that family out of there anyway. This is my number one complaint I get, besides girdling those trees and impaling people in the forest, plugging culverts. I got in here, this is way over my head, and the water's in the front part, and the farmer's getting flooded out. This guy, (laughs) he wanted to kill him okay, and he wanted to dump arsenic in this stream because Idaho has these crazy mining laws that go way back where, and they can get dynamite and stuff that they want to. And I go, you're you're dumping arsenic in there, yeah? Where's your cabin? About over here. You think there's a water source that goes by your cabin? He looked, well, I never thought about that. I said, yeah, probably not a good idea to put arsenic in that stream. <laughs> well, it's beavers, blank, blank, blank. I said, well, we'll take care of it. Don't worry. So it's one thing to get students and think about. It's another thing to capture these animals in a humane, two-eyed, seeing, compassionate way. This is how you do that. Has anybody ever live trap beavers? Has anybody killed beavers? Don't raise your hand for that. Okay, good. This is how you do it. First of all, you get a couple students. These are undergrads. <laughs> they, had, they have no knowledge of beavers at all. Matter of fact, they're going on to a clinical lab setting where they work in the lab. They're going to be clinical lab scientists. They're going to draw your blood, figure out what's wrong with you, and uh, that's going to be their job the rest of their lives. But I, this is at Idaho State, which is in the southern part of our Idaho had some dollars, and they wanted to do some research their senior year. I said, okay, I have some projects. So we're going to trap beaver. What? I said, yep, that's what we're going to do. And they understand why, and I won't, go, I won't go to all that. But they're setting traps. They're powerful women. They don't need uh, the males around to do this. They can do it themselves. So they're setting traps, big traps. Alex and Jen, by the way, we'll see their research paper at the end. That's what it looks like. It's a big, like, clam shell, if you haven't seen it. We dig a hole here to entice the beavers to come in. They don't like their dams broken. They hear that water. It kind of drives them crazy. These little green things here are the students' apples from their lunches. Put it for bait. What I found that works best was a guy, a guy shaving lotion named Sergeant Moeller. Sergeant Moeller is a retired drill sergeant who would work with me to motivate high school kids to be out in the wilderness. Man, those retired sergeants are wonderful. And they motivate kids, all kids. And he had the most god-awful aftershave that he thought was the most attractive thing ever. And I got a couple of bottles of that from him because he'd buy it in bulk, you know, cases. And I put that in there, and beavers come every time to that thing. I don't know, I don't know why. I've tried it many times. It stinks, but... Uh, They seem to like it as well. So if you're successful, this happens. The trap closes, and you capture an animal in there. Now, because of the cage system, we can, quote, work the animal. What does that mean? Well, we can measure the length and width of the tail. We're going to do some other stuff with the tail. I'll show you in a minute. We can pull a hair sample. We can do general health. And the animal isn't injured, nor does the animal injure you, if you do it right. You have to be careful of their teeth, of course. You know, these animals like this are like first-year grad students. They're nervous. They don't know what's going to happen. And if they don't die, you know, soon, then they start to trust you. And these rural beavers calm down right away. They said, all right, you're not going to kill me. You can't hurt me because I'm in this thing, whatever it is, and you're going to fiddle around with me. I don't like it, but at least I'm not going to die. Same way with first-semester grad students. Once they get there, they... They're going to be okay. They settle down. 
This is for Finley. New. So we decided, how do we track these beavers? You catch them, where do they go? How do you know it's your beaver? Well, one thing, it's not my beaver anyway. They belong to themselves and the creators, secondly. So I got to thinking, who knows about how to track those? Nobody, nobody, nobody. Go to literature, nobody, nobody. Well, they had ideas. They'd put a little collar on their back. These beavers are super smart. You put a collar on their back, they get their relatives to take it off. I don't know how, but they do it quick. You can implant. I have on the Shoshone Bannock tribe, I work with elders, call them a council of elders, and they tell me what you can do and can't do with beavers. Beaver's a sacred animal to many tribes. The, the two eyed seeing concept here is beavers in the non native world are called keystone species. Again, I'm recovering chemists, so I'm, you may, you, probably a lot of you know this already. But because of them, many live. They build their dams, the riparian zone grows, fish thrive, water's good. They don't make it out of concrete, water filters out, keystone species. Buffalo is another keystone species for plains, grass, high plains tribes. That one animal helps many. And the non-native world is called the sacred animal. It's kind of the same story. They don't use the word keystone, they use the word sacred, because one animal is helping many. So we point that out. Um, so they don't want this animal messed around with. These council builders don't want to tag, put it in sear, they don't want to clip it, because it's, it's a sacred animal. But what about tattooing? Does anybody have any tattoos? Don't raise your hand about it if you could do, but... Have you thought about how to do that? If you've had tattoos, you know. You go to a tattoo master. So I go to our town, and I find the grandmaster of tattoos. He doesn't want his picture taken, so I didn't put it up here. I respected that. Juan. Juan went to federal prison. He learned his craft inside. Really a smart guy, huge guy. Good guy to be on your side. I go, Juan, I want to tattoo these beavers. What? What for? So I can track them. I think he thought, you know, cosmetic little butterflies or whatever. No, nah, not really. I said, okay. <clears throat> so I told Juan what I wanted to do, but I needed an instrument to do that. He said, how are you going to do that? And I thought, well, I thought I'd get ink and, you know, and a needle, tattoo a number sequence. How many numbers? Two. How are you going to hold them? I showed him. He said, let me think about that. Come back tomorrow. I come back tomorrow. Juan made this thing. Ingenious device. Nobody has it. It's a tattoo field machine. This is a plug-in. It charges a battery so you can take it out. And it makes a small needle that makes the needle go hundreds of times a second. The ink is in here. Tattoo gun for field use for beaver. Juan made it. He says, you need to practice. I bring the students. How do you practice doing tattoos? He has a chunk of leather in his shop. He said, practice on that. He's helping us, helping us. Students are all excited. Practice on tattoos. First time ever, we're going to try to tattoo a beaver. So when you work with universities, you have all sorts of regs with animal care, and you should, IRBs and should. <clears throat> the IRB didn't cover tattoo gun. The Council of Elders did. And they go, how are you going to make sure the animal doesn't get hurt? I said, I don't know. I'll go ask Professor Wan. I go, Professor Wan, when you tattoo people, how do you know they're not hurting? He says, well, they lie. They say they're not hurting, but they are. But I watch their eye lid right at the corner. And if it twinses down, I know I'm hurting them. He says, you got to watch that beaver's eye. Let's see. So we did. We put a uh, student in the front. I'm holding the back. And a student's going to tattoo the first beaver ever. So I'm telling you, this is their first shot. So it's not a work of art. It's probably the worst picture I've taken. This is my big thumb here, and I'm trying to take a picture with my other hand and hold this animal. So it's not very good. But if you could imagine, you'll see a two here. See, a, see it kind of jump out at you? Even if you can't, just shake your head yes, and I'll go with that. And then a zero. Two zero, because this is in the second stream and the zero animal. Did pretty good the first time out. It's better if you looked right down on it. This is a beaver tail. 
it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough. And so we, this takes about 30 seconds, 15 if they get right with it, no more than 15 seconds. And never does the eye twinge. Never does the animal exhibit pain, which is important for us. So we put a tat on that animal. And then we're ready to collect data. So I present it to the National Science Foundation story form. I show these slides. I prevent, I present very little text. I tell them about two-eyed seeing. They still don't quite understand it, but they're buying it better. So compassion and patience. One of the elders says, you know, Ed, I see you do lots of stuff. Thanks for working with our children. But are you teaching compassion and are you teaching patience? And I'm sad I had to look at him and say, no. And he looks at me and goes, why not? And I says, I will from now on. I didn't think that was a science teacher's job. But folks, it's everybody's job. That's what he was telling me. He's absolutely right. And I think, I'm going to get on my soapbox now, here I am. We lack compassion and patience big time in our society for lots of reasons. <clears throat> off my soapbox now. So this is in honor of Frank Findlay, if not that again, but new research coming from that story because I like him so much. So one thing I learned to do is we give the beavers a name. This is the student's data sheet. I have some Franks too and I have some lorries. I just want you to know that are, that are beavers. So we give them names. So they're not just a number. They're an entity now. And then the student collects, oh, the beavers, a couple things they don't like. They seem to be okay with tattooing because it's on their tail. But this sex scene, you have, they have to go in, you have to palpate their cavity. They don't seem to like that. The other thing they don't like, I don't know why, they don't like rectal swabs either. <laughs> they, they, they tell me they don't like it, they don't like it, they move around. And we do that because we're searching for giardia, or a common name is beaver fever. And so you swab the rectal, and then we take that to a hospital. We're also going to do it on the field, but we double-check it on the hospital. And we can tell if the beaver has that, that little <clears throat> organism in it. But it just shows you the length and width, the tail. But the name part is the most important thing. This is data that will not go from this room, nor will I turn it over to the federal government, nor will I give it to Idaho Fish and Game. When I first started this project, I was willy-nilly about things and wood. This shows where all the beaver dams are in this stream. This is the main road, and when we first did, did this, nine times out of ten, this data would mysteriously get out, and trappers would come right behind and kill all these animals, because they knew where they were at. I won't do it now. I'd say, I have it, but I'm keeping it. I'll give it to the tribe, they can have it, and you can go to the tribe and ask for it, but I'm not giving it out. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, I'm just saying that happens. The beaver's market, we have you know, these coordinates, where we, we go back and we visit <coughs> these lodges, and that's a whole bunch of them, it's easy to get them. It's not fair for the beaver to show where their houses are for people who aren't compassionate with them. The other thing is you deal with a the beaver, they're really a nocturnal animal. They don't like that bright sunlight, I don't blame them. And so we hold them no more than 48 hours. This is a special holding pin I built. It's double weaved net. Many beavers tried to escape, they cannot. Many coyotes have tried to get in there, they cannot. Part of it goes in the water, part's on the ground, because beavers need to get out. They don't live in the water all the time. They get out and they, they use their castor gland and coat themselves. And the students take care of them. They cover it up. They put half in water. The students do all this work. They feed them. We don't feed them more than two days because we don't want them to become dependent on human beings, even nice human beings. We don't want that. So they're in this cage no more than 48 hours. They're in there because we're trying to catch the whole family, not just a single beaver. Partners. <laughs> fill, out, fill out those government forms. They want to know your collaborators. I call them partners. Who is your partner? Community partnerships. <clears throat> you 
These fine folks are Shoshone Bannock tribal members. Just wrote a letter of recommendation for this guy yesterday. They catch a beaver, which is this guy, if you didn't know. They're bringing him up. Our workbench is a truck. Woman that lives in this house here, can you see the roof? She put a kill order on these guys because they were chopping down this huge tree here. Her reason, she's 90 years old. Her reason is that her and her father planted that tree. And she'd take offense to beavers that want to use it. I can understand her part, the two-eyed seeing. But we told her we're not going to kill them. We're going to move them. She said, okay. That's why we're there. Put it up on the truck. The bag. We do all of our work here, outside. These are all Shoshone Bannock uh, students, my students, by the way, working on beaver. <clears throat> Sometimes we take them inside a school to show other students. If I get a nice, tame one that doesn't mind traveling, I'll pick that one out, and that's what we'll do. And uh, this young man is about ready to pull a hair sample off of them. You got to be careful because they can overheat really easy. You know, they have wool, I don't know, not wool, but hair, and it's warm. They're not used to that. They're kind of scared. Usually they, they calm down. They're not so afraid. See these hands? You're going to see the rest of them in a minute. I just thought that was a cool picture. I just wanted to show you that picture. Helping hands. Get it? Okay, that's it. Here's a stem joke, and it's your own fault. So I'm coming in. I'm telling the... My family and elders, I'm going up to say this Kootenai land. A lot of them know where it's at. They go, why are you going so far? I go, because that's another home of mine. They go, okay. <clears throat> they go, you need to take something with you. I go, what? A book. Really? I, you thought texting was bad. Try to read when you're driving on these roads, you know? What book do you think they told me I should take? Any guesses from the audience? Remember, you brought this on yourself, remember? And a hush goes over the crowd. Okay, a math book. A math book. Why a math book? You ready? Prepare yourselves. Because there's safety in numbers. Oh, I told you. Tried to warn you. This is on the Yakima Reservation. They're using beavers as a learning tool. I've helped them introduce this. This is their holding pin. This is, you know that one that we made with the cage in the water? This is what they... I've come up with. <clears throat> There's the hands. This is their method of catching a beaver on their reservation. They use a little uh, snare trap. They don't use a big cage. And they put the beaver head first in there and they can work on it while its head's stuck in that cone. These here are, are high school, college students, and working professionals with the tribe. They understand beavers. They understand the sacredness of the beaver. But what they want, like many tribes want, they want their youth involved. They want them to come outside. You know, just because you're Indian doesn't mean you're the best rider and tractor and outdoors person in the world. Some don't even go out there. They're addicted to put their thumbs to these little games on their electronic gizmos. So to get them out there, this is, uh, this is a good project for them. Yakima Rez. Um, this is veterinary clinic. We're doing Giardia testing the very first time. Uh, this is my friend that just passed away a couple years ago, Laverne Bronco. He's our culture advisor, still is. And we're learning how to test uh, the rectal samples I got through these chemical processes with the veterinarian. The veterinarian has donated her clinic. If we get an a animal that's wounded, broken leg, whatever, she'll look at it and treat it. No charge as long as there are students involved. So now we introduce students to what veterinary medicine is, how to do these clinical lab tests. They learn chemistry. They learn behavior of the animal. <clears throat> and they get to meet new people, which is important. All because beavers. <clears throat> Again, these are sequence that I did not know about. The literature talks about it, but I didn't do it. I'm just sharing my story with you. How do you transport a beaver. Lots of ways. The objective is transport them so they don't die, right? You don't want them to die in your process. Number one way of moving 
a beaver family around is like this. Again, on Shoshone Bannock Indian Reservation, there's a, there's a whole family. There's six of them in there. They average about 80 pounds a piece. So you can do the math what that weighs. They're kind of heavy. This guy here is the most interesting story. He's a scientist at our nuclear lab outside of a place called Idaho Falls. He had lived in Pocatello area, went back east for his education, come back, works at the lab, and to this very time here, had not been around Indian, Indian people at all. What I like about this slide is not only there's a family and family and family, but this little guy, he's with him all the time. He's seeing who Indians are, what Indians are, what beavers are, and you never know what seed you plant in that little one's mind. And we're going to see more examples of that. This, this, this gauge turned out to be something really cool to report to the federal government. They're still kind of thinking about it, but I'll, we'll go into that in a minute. But this is an encounter of families that this guy is eight miles away from the reservation, never been there, never been around this many Indians ever in his life. He wasn't nervous, he was all right. <clears throat> These are forest rangers. They're using four wheelers, tilt the, the cage up, and they're strapping it down, ready to pack it up upstream. They're in an area where there's plenty of cattle have abused the stream. Their idea was to just dump them in there and you know they had to work their magic, beaver magic, and it fixed everything. Not so easy. Cows still there. They keep hammering the dams. This wasn't a complete success. It was a success. We got to put the idea in their heads, but we had to fence off areas. Once we did that, then it started to work. <coughs> anyway, they use four-wheelers. <coughs> this guy is a cool character. Old-time cowboy, volunteered, lives right by the reservation, not on it. Said, Ed, I think... My horse and I can help you pack those up to the headstream. He designed these special cages and his packard. What's interesting, you can't hear here is the beaver is nervous. It's clicking its teeth. The horse hears it. The horse is nervous. It doesn't like something live on his back, clicking its teeth. He's used to dead things on it, like dead deer or whatever. And this guy is using improper English, making both of them be quiet because he's about ready to lose all, all of them. Finally does it. He raised this, this mare from a colt. She trusts him. Students get to see this, how he can calm, how they can calm down a horse with his voice. They get to see the beavers in there, and off they go 10 miles up this stream, the headwaters of this stream. Beavers in tow. Beaver taught the salmon how to jump. Laverne Bronco, our coastal teacher, told me that. The next series are lectures by themselves, but I'm not going to get into that because we don't have that time. But I'll show you, I'll show you the two-eyed seeing. It isn't just beavers. Now you're dealing with salmon, another fish. <clears throat> if in fact you find an old refrigerator, and if in fact you clean it out, and if in fact you put raceways in there, and put the the head of the refrigerator on the side of the bank and plumb it in to a stream there and the water meanders through all gravity fed and leaves here, you can put salmon eggs in there and grow salmon. Yeah? The cost to do this depends on the paint job, all with student labor, is about $35. If I get stuff donated, I can drop that down to $25 easy, even lower than that. All done by students. What happens, there's fisheries experts sitting right here, by the way. Use this vibrant box. This is developed in France in the 50s. And you put your eggs in here, salmon eggs. You can put other eggs, steelhead eggs or trout eggs, but I'll pick on salmon because that's what we did. This is our incubator. The fish fall through that in the nursery. And they exit as fry, small fry. Get it? Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't give me another stem joke. I got tens of them. Okay.
This team is doing the student's job because they were mandated to stay in school this day and take state exams. So they couldn't go. But the eggs were ready to go. So we did a 2 ic concept, and they did their job as good students taking state exams, which are kind of silly, but anyway, they did it. And their mentors put the, put the eggs in the refrigerator. Where do I get these refrigerators, do you think? That's a burning question you have. From the students' community on the reservation. I said, let's build one. This is the first one we built. I said, I think it's going to work. Bring some more in. Within a week, I had 30 refrigerators because they're all over the res. You know, you can find them any place. We make them environmentally safe, take the Freon out, clean them. We, we take the door handles off, so if it goes down, if there's a little person in there, they can get out. They can't suffocate in there. But it's really good for field use because the door is heavy enough. It doesn't blow out. One, we're close to wilderness here where this one, and we, we went up higher. And a bear got one of our boxes. And I could see it from, the, from our rig. I said, let me scout to make sure that bear's out of there. And it was. Tipped it over and it's going after those eggs. I go, man, I can tell right now it's a teenage bear. And I'm with these native students. They go, Ed, how can you tell that? You know, you didn't even get out and track. And I go, because it went after a refrigerator like you guys do when you're hungry. You know, that's... Only teenagers do that. So see, not only do you get bad jokes, they get bad jokes all the time. So, so loading it up. This is a cool slide. Laverne and his boy, his family, this guy's daughter, and he's just helping out too. But his family's helping families. They're loading up this box. We'll show you what it looks like in there in a minute. That's <coughs> what it looks like. About 60,000 salmon eggs in that box. Hatcheries do the same job, a little bit more money. Ours is, again, about $35. It's gravity fed. We have permits to do that. The astounding story, and again, I'm not pointing fingers. There's enough hatred in the world that's deep. But we try to get our permit because it's endangered species. We talked to Idaho Fishing Game, and I have lots of friends. One of the officers said, Ed, you'll never believe what those game wardens were saying about this. I said, I believe it. Tell me. He goes, well... We did our drawings, we did our presentation, I left. Honest story from my buddy that was in the room saying, this can't work because those Indians thought about it. Can't work because they're not trained to do it. We got this idea from a veterinarian in Rock Springs, Wyoming. Probably one of the smartest guys next to Sam Matson, Don Williams, that I know. Really smart guy. So, yeah, those Indians did it. Nobody else had done it with salmon to this point except to Shone Bank Tribe. And uh, that's not too I see, and that's your eyes and ears and your heart closed to learning. But we did it. <clears throat> this is what they look like this, about this time of year up in the Sawtooth Range in Idaho, next to the Frank Church Wilderness, which is a million acre, two, three million acre plot. You might wonder what this is. This is because I'm lazy. Because, <laughs> I'm just being truthful here, because in the winter that's what it looks like. You walk in with snowshoes, and my mass is so great I sink like a, like a giant bear in the snow, you know? And I waddle through there, and I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build this instrument that's going to remote sense if those fish are alive, if they're moving, if it's freezing, and I'm going to relay this information to a satellite. And I'm going to have that satellite tell me what I want to know from my laptop. So when I get up in the morning, I get my bunny slippers on and my cup of coffee. <clears throat> Don't even want to think about my pajamas. I won't go there. But anyway, when I'm doing that, I can dial up this box remotely. I have patent pending for this one. It works really well. How do we evaluate... Everybody in this room has taken a federal dollars, at least from this country, not maybe not so in Canada. They ask the question, what did we get for our money? How do we evaluate it? This is how I did it and do it. I first of all do, a, do this uh, heading, stories we learned from Beaver. We capture Beaver, 
this is all, we prayed for Beaver, we ask it's okay, we take a family, and we release them. Look at the stream. Pay attention to the depth of that stream. Three years later, that's what it looks like. The landowner is happy. I think the beavers are happy. I'm happy. And we've improved that stream for its capacity. We, not we, they have done it. One web evaluation. The family of flowers, sunflowers that went on the bank came. That's what they're doing there. Recharging the water. Riparian zone. A way of evaluating the success of a program. <coughs> Sometimes you get characters like this. Not beaver. Raccoon. Let me tell you about raccoon quickly. They're very fast and they have very sharp teeth. And they don't like being in here. They're a bit cranky when I come up to them. It's their fault. It's the one that got in there. So I talk to it. I go, Mr. Raccoon, I'm going to open, because you have to open up this clam with your hands. I got to put my fingers here and down here. I said, I got to open this up to get you out. Don't bite me. I'm just, just doing my job. You do your job, you get out. So I start it. <clears throat> I make sure I've made contact with the raccoon. It retreats to this corner. It waits for an opening, like it understood me. Maybe it did. Doesn't bite me and runs out of there. Happy day for both of us. We evaluate it by, remember I said we give names? These are two elders. This guy, unfortunately, has passed away. And his wife, we named these beavers after them. The wife still asks, about Larry the Beaver. His name's Larry. They asked Larry the Beaver. And they got, it was raining, come out to see it. Wanted to look at their namesake. It's important. Community involvement. <coughs> this we learned, there's a mathematician in here, Dr. Shockey. He's probably heard this story, and even if he had, he'll act like he hasn't because he's polite. But they messed up on their math class, Beavers. This is absolutely proof. I, I tell the government that. Beavers make dams on nice straight angles like this. They'll dam this up. Notice the trick here. There's an angle here, and water can come into the sides. Not one beaver yet, knock on wood, has figured out this angle. They can't figure it out. They'll give up. They'll dig underneath it, or they'll come up and go over here, but they can't figure out how to make a dam that takes care of that angle. They messed up on their trig class, you know. I don't know what they were doing. Probably sleeping in. Probably doing gizmos. Well, they don't have those thumbs like that. But anyway, I don't know what they were doing. If we, if we build this deceiver, this is called a beaver deceiver, don't get me mixed up with a beaver baffler. If we go to baffler, we won't get out of here until 2 in the afternoon. Don't even bring that question up. Just kidding. Dr. Larry, this is the roughest crowd I've ever seen here, you know. <laughs> this one I really like. This is for students. Capture a beaver. All I did is open up the cage. He gets out, looks around. It's a he. I know its name. I think I called him Todd, actually. So from here to here, beaver knows what's to do. Gets out. It's headed right for there. It doesn't ask. It doesn't ask permission. It doesn't say, where's my permit? Where's my this? Where's my that? It knows what to do. And it doesn't need your help. It wants to do what it's designed to do. Who else does that? These students. A lot of them don't know what they're supposed to do. That's our job as teachers, if you didn't know that, is to help guide their way. They know what they're supposed to do. They just need a little edging. This here, these two are going to dance at Idaho State University. My brother Duncan there. And their lesson is I'm telling them they can be good scientists. They're on the beaver team and mathematician. This girl is really interested in math. And you can be a mathematician and a scientist and still be a native person. Two-eyed seeing. You know, don't give up who you are. When you go to these silly schools, uh, some reason they do their damnedest to take out who you are. Don't let them do that. You are who you are. You know what you're supposed to do. You just need a little help. This guy, wearing the cone of shame, giving it his best to help out. Everybody helps out what he can do. 
I like this guy because he looks to me like he's smiling, you know. Just some dog coming out, say, hey, what's going on over here? Helping out because he smiles. I like it. With the cone of shame. <clears throat> You're on the Shoshone Paiute Reservation now. These are office workers. Come out because we have a beaver in a trap down here. You can't see that park. They all come out. What the heck's Ed doing down there? The last one I report to government is who's learning from who. And I don't have the answer for this. I got something to show you. Brand new. Where's Finley at? Brand new research here. Have you heard about the Vulcan mind melt? This is the beaver mind melt. This little girl, this, her mom gave me this picture. She is focused on this guy. And this guy on her. And they're one. And I asked her later, what were you thinking about? I was thinking about how I could take care of him. This here is a future council member, future president of the United States, first female president right here, future lawyer, future congresswoman, and we're planting seeds of looking at these animals as family, taking care of one another. And these students this age are attracted to these beaver every time. Let me show you some more examples. guy just crawls up in the pickup, wants to set by the beaver. Doesn't ask me. He knows what he's supposed to do. I know there's a link there. Vulcan mind melt, the beaver mind melt now. They're visiting. I don't know what they're doing, but it's weird. I report this to the government. Another one. Every time, if there's a beaver somewhere, there's a kid there. That's success for me because we're planting seeds how to take care of these animals. <laughs> this was really cute. I went to a, a uh, on the Show Pie Reservation summer program, about 50, 60 kids. And I said, yeah, I'm going to bring this beaver in here. I told them, prepare them. They hadn't seen it. The squeals out when they see it. And I said, just don't poke it or watch out for its teeth. So I'm doing something as, you, as we do, and I turn around. And this little girl is after her cousin to film her as she's petting the beaver. She wanted to do that. And she's being careful. The teeth are here, and the beaver's being calm. But that was her mission, to get her cousin in on this uh, experiment. We also started a new winter study. Where's my Canadian person? With some good Canadian researcher friends of mine. This is a beaver lodge if you don't know, home to about eight beavers, well-constructed, ready for the winter. Picture not taken too long ago. There's another type of lodge here. See? It says beaver there. Do you want to know the stem joke? You don't want to know the stem joke, do you? Okay. All right. All right, then. <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah. What we found out with beavers in the winter is that they provide a source of water for other animals. Obviously a lodge here, beavers coming out, it has its stash of sticks that it lives on around this area and when it swims to go get it, it breaks the ice, which makes an opportunity for other animals to get water. One of the biggest things for large animals in the winter is getting water. They can find food, they need water. So if it's frozen, feet thick, hard, beavers help out. The Canadian team realized this, and now we're really looking at it. This is a cartoon of a beaver lodge. What I want you to notice is that all of them I found have an air vent constructed in there for fresh air. They have circulation through that dwelling. Not just a, oh, it's a cute little dwelling, but it's well thought about, built. I've seen videos, I, I was in Alaska this summer, of a grizzly bear trying to get in there, romping on it with grizz power. Can't do it. Man, those things are stout. What the government does, they'll use dynamite to blow them up. Well, there, that's another story. The other thing the Canadian team led, and we're confirming, is that not only do they provide water source for large animal, nesting habitat, I like this, for Canadian geese, you know, because they're in Canada, it's geese. Oh, 
Art, did you get that? Yeah, I, I figured you did. So here's a picture of one, <clears throat> because not only is that a good place to be, but you can't see the water over here. Other animals can't get to them, can't get to their nest. They have to swim. Nah, they're not so excited. Fox really like to get in there, but they don't like to get wet that bad. Here's an, another example. I missed this picture of a bird that was there. But see, they picked a good area, and just before the ice started to break up, built a nest in there. So now, two I'd see in from their perspective. Water, nesting, home for beaver. You know, these beaver, I found out, share their lodge with other animals. Muskrat and frog. They don't put otter in there. I think otter has sharp teeth and could eat them. So they're giving the boot out. <laughs> Those other ones, come on in, as long as you behave yourself. Pretty cool. I brought that into the study. I, I like this picture because these beavers, they don't care about rain. It's raining right now. Appears to be pretty happy, little guy. Wondering what I'm doing. But, you know, they work. They don't ask for a salary. They don't ask for credit. They don't ask for pats on the back. They just do their job. They're a beaver. Castor candanitas. I like this one because it's a family that's out sunning themselves. I can tell because they're... Their fur is extended out. They're getting as much sunshine as they can. They just seem content with their brothers and sisters. Just being a family out for some sunshine on a winter day. How do you read this little slide about beers? I kind of, they're not all the time busy. I've seen them goof around a lot, like swimming backwards. There's no reason for them to do that that I can understand, just that they like to do it. I've seen them play chicken with one another, swim full speed to one another, last minute veer off to one side. I've seen them walk on their two legs and sing a little beaver song. Honestly, it's a little song. So, I don't know. I, they're busy, but they're not all the time busy. <clears throat> Who knows? It says in this, I was curious, the second largest rodent. Who knows where the first largest rodent is and what it is in the world? Yes, where do they live? Yeah, they're 20 feet long to up to 200 pounds. That's a long animal, isn't it? That's the largest rodent. This is the secret to everything. We have another grant that Lori is part of. She's still part of it. <clears throat> called AGAP. They have indigenous mentoring relationships. Spent a lot of money on, on relationships. But this is it. For Morris, treat people, treat your students like people. Get to know them. That's it. Don't need a special program. Don't need this or don't need that. You need, you need to treat students like people. That doesn't happen in the academic world. They're treated as subclass many times. Sometimes they're professors. I get to hack on the universities now so I can go with my foundation. <laughs> Sometimes they're professors want them to be clones of themselves. They never ask the student, do you want to be a clone of me? No, I don't want to be a clone of you. I want to be me. But they're treated that way. And it's because the professors don't know any better. We're educating them in this two-eyed seeing concept. But this is the key. This is it. And it was freely given. From my perspective, that's it. This is a study that was published up. Sorry, I went by the reference part. You should see it. Alex Freeman and Genevieve McMillan. They're the two students that did that study. And then we wrote a paper up. I didn't even want to put my name on it because they did all the work. They submitted that. It's a reference there. Uh-oh. Went too far. Well, anyways, question time. That's the last slide. Are there any questions there? I'm about to my double time limit here. Go ahead. If you use the mic, it's, everybody can hear it. So when you remove the beaver yeah. from its site, is it like a grizzly bear that will come back to that site? Yeah. That's a really good question. What we found, if we are going to transport beaver, you've got to do it as a family unit. 
It's like taking Lori, well, Lori, this is a bad example because Lori's been all over the world. So it's like taking Lori and dumping her in the middle of New York City. Of course she'd do good because she's been all over the world. But she'd do better if she had family members with her. And yeah, why would they go back? Because that's her home. And I have come to firmly believe in the end that's where we're all going, back home. There's other tribes I work with that have star stories and say our home was there. We're here, but we're going to go back home. Salmon we deal with. Travel in our neck of the woods 950 miles one way from the mouth of Columbia back home. They know how to go home. Those migrating Canadian geese that take a break on the beaver houses, lodges, they're going back home. You at the end, there was already a prayer said, you have a safe trip back home. So yeah, they go back home. They may find other interests along the way, but yeah, they try to make it back. That's their home. That's what they know about. Any other questions? I have some for you. I'm glad you gave me this break here. So, <clears throat> What do you think... I'm going to pick on students because they're here. What's the number one... Well, number one reason students don't do not go on to school. Why is it that in our stats from the National Science Foundation, the total number of American Indian PhD scholars is 0.1 percent? The Hispanic is about eight to ten. The black population is 15, 12 to 15, and the white population is around 35 to 40. Why is it American Indians are 0.1%, do you think? Hush goes over the crowd. One, there isn't an exact answer. There are some general ideas. General ideas is school, for a lot of Native families, has not been very user-friendly. There's boarding school times, and there's lots of reasons. That's one. But more importantly is students aren't felt welcome in a sense of place. Nor is their knowledge valued like a two-eyed seeing concept. The two graduate students that I have a privilege of working with in this room know that. Their knowledge, even today, they battle for a place at the table. That's one reason. We can talk about finances and all that, but I tell you this straight up. That if you don't feel welcome at a university or school, don't worry about finances. Don't worry about you know, services they have for you, because it's not going to make any difference. If you don't feel welcome, there isn't enough money in the world to make you go there. You have to go because you want to. There's a reason. Oh, I feel a, bit, a lot better since I told you that. You know that already. You like that beaver getting out of the cage. You know that already. But I want to sum, eight, I want to sum this up with... Lori's, it isn't Lori's conference, it's all of our conference, that we're here together because of a reason. All different reasons, minor students, but this two-eyed seeing concept I graciously borrowed from Lori's tribe, Pickback, and from Elder Albert, who graciously shared, and Morris Many Fingers. We're about sharing. It's who we were, are as Indian people is what we will continue to do all of our lives. And I'm, I've been to a conference last week with these young people presenting their research, and it brought so much hope. People are doing amazing things. These young native scholars, they're our hope of our nation, not just for Indians, our whole nation, whole world. And it was so refreshing, refreshing to see you students here today. You're our hope into a world that likes to talk about no hope way too much. You're our hope, and it's an honor being before you, and an honor seeing Frank and, and Lori and the other Frank, my family on the Flathead Indian Reservation by this beautiful lake. That's all I have, unless you want some more stem jokes. Say no. All right. Thank you very much. Unless there's any questions. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Question. One more joke. One more joke? Okay. No, not urine joke. A lake joke. I'll do a lake joke. So... There was this, um, there was this little, little circle. This is a math joke because we have an ethnomathematician over there, a big giant named Todd Shockey. 
So this is a circle joke. He wanted to see the lake all his life in the textbook, you know, circle joke. And couldn't do it. Finally saved up his, his money. I didn't know circles got paid, but they had a little bit of money. He got paid. His name was Jeff. Jeff, where are you going? To the Flathead Lake. Why are you going there? I wanted to all my life. What for, Jeff? Are you ready for it? Because he was hoping he would see a pirate. You know, pie, get it? <laughs> you asked for it, remember? I was ready to go, but you asked for it. That's it. Thank you very much. Enjoy the conference. Get over here. Get your hug. <laughs> Great job. Thank you. Great job. Thank you very much.